Good morning. How are you this morning? You sure about that? Okay. This morning I have an interesting story for you. Have you ever heard about a man by the name of Ben Carson? You have? So you already know my story. <laughs> ben Carson is a Seventh-day Adventist doctor. And uh, he's a very, very famous, well-known doctor because he's performed some amazing surgeries. You know what a surgery is, right? What happens in a surgery? You get parts replaced. Yep. <laughs> Good old-fashioned panel beating, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Surgery, they cut you open, and sometimes they replace parts, or they fix parts, or whatever needs to be done, right, from the inside. So it's, you've got to be quite clever to do that, don't you? Can just anyone be a surgeon? Would you be worried if I offered to operate on you? Yeah, you should be. Yeah. Yeah, not just anyone can be a surgeon. Now, today he's a very famous surgeon, very well known, because he performed one of the first successful, if not the very first successful operation to separate two conjoined twins. Now, do you know what conjoined means? They're stuck together. Where were they stuck together? On their heads, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And he was the doctor that performed that surgery, and not only did they survive, but both of them had very, very little, if any, brain damage. So they were able to lead normal lives again, and that's kind of what made him very famous. And by the age of 33, how many of you are 33 here? None of you guys are 33 yet. Don't worry, I'm not 33 either yet. No, I'm not. Do I look like your grandfather? No. I'm 32. I'm almost there. So he was only one year older than he was only one year older than me. And you know what? He had already become the head of the children's neurosurgery department at the John Hopkins University. Now that's whatever, whatever that means. The bottom line is he was very successful. And he was very young when he was very successful. Sound like a great guy? Now I've told you the end of the story. You'll be surprised to hear how he got to that point. Because he wasn't born into a very happy home. And he didn't have the best of education. And his parents divorced. In fact, his mother was one girl out of a family of 24 children. Anybody got 23 brothers and sisters? No? Man, you need to tell your parents you want more brothers and sisters. She was one of 24, and you know when she quit school? In the third grade. Who's here in grade one? Grade two? Grade two. Grade three? Anybody in grade three? No, you're not in grade three. I know that. Who's in grade four, five, six? Ah, that's better. Can you read quite well? Could you read really well in grade three? Or still learning, eh? So she dropped out of school in grade three, which means she couldn't read or write very well. She could get by, maybe, kind of. And by 13, she was married. Who's 13 here? There's a 13-year-old over there. Can you imagine being married, Samuel, already? <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> 13, she was married to a much older man who was a Baptist minister. And so, by the time her son, Ben, was eight years old, she and this older man had divorced. So, can you see that Ben didn't really have the best of family backgrounds, right? His mother could hardly read and write. She couldn't help him with his schoolwork. He was, he was labeled the dummy in the class. And he was called all sorts of strange names. How many of you have been called strange names at school? How many of you called other kids strange names at school? Yeah, I know you, Seth, probably, eh? Oh, okay. Yeah. He was, you know, he was that guy in the class that everyone thought wouldn't do anything of their lives. You know, it was just a waste of time. Why does he even come to school, this guy? He could hardly read. He could hardly write. He was bullied at school. He was called funny names. And one day, him and his friend, his best friend, were arguing over music. 
This is how bad his life had become. They were arguing over music, and he got so angry, his friend smashed his stereo system. So Ben picked up a knife which was nearby and stabbed his friend. Luckily for Ben, his friend was wearing a big old buck belt buckle, and the knife hit the belt buckle, and so, you know, nothing happened to his friend, fortunately. But that's when Ben realized he had a serious temper control problem. You know what temper is, right? When you keep losing your cool, start screaming, shouting, throwing stuff. You know, when you get upset, can't control yourself, become all mean and so on. That's when he realized, and he actually, at that young age, decided he needed help, and the only thing he could think of to help him was God. And so he turned to God, and that began his spiritual journey. Now, this is Ben's background. So what is it that changed him from that young boy at eight years old with a family that's divorced, can hardly read or write, he's being called the dummy in the class, he's getting into fights, he's got a temper control problem, and then at the, e at the end of his life, he's what? Famous neurosurgeon, head of the Department of Medicine, he's got two university degrees, in, psycho in psychiatry, psychology, and in medicine. How did he go from that place to the good place? Well, it was thanks to that mother that he had. Remember the one that could hardly read or write? When she was called into the principal's office one day to find out that he was failing, he had Ds and Fs all over his report card, not very good, she decided that Ben had had enough TV. So one of the first things she did was she smashed up the TV. No more TV for Ben. And then she said to him, every week from now onwards, you're going to go to the library, and you're going to take out two books, and you're going to read those books from cover to cover, and you're going to write me a written report. And then you're going to give it to me. And so every week, Ben had to read two books. Now remember, he couldn't read very well, right? Probably him and his mother read about the same level. In fact, after a while, Ben was reading such difficult books, and writing such good reports that his mother could hardly read or understand what the reports were that he was writing. And so, little by little, week by week, as he was reading these two books a week, he became educated. He began learning about the world, and he fell in love with reading books because he discovered a whole world out there. He could use his imagination. He could learn stuff. The sky was the limit. And Ben learned to read well. He studied, and before long, he was at the top of his eighth grade class. And I think he graduated third from the top in his high school that year. That's pretty impressive, eh? And all he did was he started to read, and his mother helped him with his discipline, and his mind began to grow and enlarge. You know that it's God's intention for you and for me that we continue to grow, continue to expand our minds? There's never a place where we can stop and say, okay, I've learned enough now. I've read enough books now. And by the way, what do you think might just be the most important book you could ever read? I would say you're right. The Bible, right? One of my favorite writers once said that there's nothing so calculated. You know what calculated means? Nothing so powerful to strengthen the mind and to broaden your ability to think than the study of the Word of God or the Bible. So what I want to challenge you with this morning is never stop growing, never stop learning, and most of all, put your learning about God above all else. Read that Bible from cover to cover. Learn about God because, listen, where are we going to go and live one day? What's that place called? Heaven. Who's in charge in heaven? God. And who's going to heaven? God's friends? How do you become God's friend? You've got to read the messages He sent to you, right? So I want to challenge you with, this with that this morning. Keep growing. Keep thinking. Study the Word of God. Read books. Educate, educate, educate. Pay attention in school. Think that might help? That's a tough one, eh? But we can start by reading, right? So I want to challenge you with that this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, will you bless each of these boys and girls this morning? Will you bless each of us as parents that we may encourage our children to learn and to grow and most of all, to seek that knowledge which is above all else, the knowledge of your character, of your will, and of your grace. 
So will you help us, Lord, to grow close to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So the interview, it was done at a university, in fact, that had asked him to come and speak to their students. And I just thought I would share a little bit with you, or let him share a little bit with you about how he approaches his medical discipline and what is it that he goes through as he prepares for a surgery. As a young boy, I dreamed of becoming a doctor. However, growing up in a single-parent home in dire poverty with poor grades How do you feel and a bad right? time. Let's try that one again. Lindsay, it's a question from Lindsay. How do you feel right before entering an extensive surgery? I would think that it's nerve-wracking. Do you have traditions before entering, like prayer or meditation or such? Okay. Um, I think about operations frequently. That's how I fall asleep at night, thinking about what I'm going to do the next day. And yes, I pray. I never enter the operating room without prayer. I ask God to give me wisdom. And he does, you know. Uh, I think God has a great sense of humor, I've got to tell you, uh, because my middle name is Solomon. And Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. And I start every day and I end every day reading from the book of Proverbs. Now, how did God know that that was going to be the case and give me that middle name of Solomon? But also, do you remember when Solomon became the king of Israel, what happened that made him very famous? Two women came to him claiming to be the mother of the same baby. What did he advocate? Divide the babies. Isn't that when I became well now? Divide the babies? <laughs> <laughs> He definitely has a sense of humor. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Well, this week we've had a very blessed week, haven't we, with the week of prayer readings. And uh, we'd like to also conclude with the week of prayer also in this service. I'd like you now to, to kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. Thank you. Dearest Heavenly Father, again, Lord, our hearts are so thankful, Lord, that we can come to worship and glorify you this morning. Father, I'm just amazed each week, and even though through your readings this week, Lord, of how much you love us, how big your grace is, Lord, and how wide your mercy is, Lord. We have no idea how much you really love us. But we have a glimpse of it, Lord, in the fact that you gave Jesus Christ to die for us, to be our Saviour, Lord. And for this we are so, so thankful, Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we have a special petition. Special petition for two very young children, Lord, that um, are suffering uh, with illness. And we'd like to bring you bef before you this morning, little Bryson, Lord. Uh, we know that uh, this morning he's gone down to Starship Hospital. Uh, and, uh, Lord, uh, we pray that you'll have your hand upon those doctors, grant them wisdom and knowledge for whatever's wrong with Bryson. Uh, you know, Lord, and you can guide them. So, Lord, we ask for a special prayer of healing upon this young boy. We pray that you're with his uh, mother and with his uh grandparents and all those, Lord, in the family that are connected with this young boy. We also like to say thank you, Lord, that you're with him and that we can claim the promise of healing for his life. We also pray, Lord, that you're with young Caleb. Lord, he's been suffering with chest infection, and Lord, it is, um, it is so shame to see him like this. We pray, Lord, that you have your hand also of healing upon young Caleb. We ask, Lord, that you'll heal him, and we thank you for his healing, Lord. And we pray that you're with his parents, that uh, with Adrian and his, uh, and his mother too, Lord Laura, so that they know uh, what to do uh, in looking after this young boy. Father, we thank you that we can bring these two children before you this morning. Heavenly Father, we'd like also to bring uh, a member of, uh, of older years, young Jansen. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with him as he's had his treatment yesterday. Give him um, comfort and relief, Lord, but also the 
unsurpassing knowledge, Lord, of knowing that you've healed him. Father, we thank you for this. And Lord, we have a great prayer of thanks uh, for the way your medicine works in our community. We thank you that Lynn was available to have the transfusion this week, and we thank you for the person that's given him the blood for, uh, f so that he could have that transfusion. We thank you, Lord, for Jim and for the progress that he's making. But Lord, there are other people in our community and our membership here in Wangarei who, are, who need you, and we might know exactly what's wrong with them, but you do, and we ask for your healing hands to be upon them, Lord. Father, we welcome the fact that we have a school here in Wangarei, and we thank you for those dedicated teachers who give so much time uh, in preparing these children, Lord, on a daily basis, not only preparing them for their lives as adults, but also preparing them, Lord, uh, for your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that your hand of uh, grace and mercy and love will be upon these teachers as they mentor and minister to these children. We thank you that they can be with us here this morning. Father, we thank you that we can ask you also to forgive us for where we've failed thee this week. And upon so doing, Lord, we pray that you please grant us forgiveness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, that we can ask that your Holy Spirit will come uh, in amongst us in such a powerful way that he will fill our hearts, Lord, with praise and glory for you again, and that he'll, that you'll anoint our minister this morning, that he will bring us words of life in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'm going to ask Kay to come forward. I want to introduce to you Kay Milicic over here. You may not have seen her before, but she's currently our headmaster at the uh, Whangarei Adventist uh, School, and uh, she's going to share with us an introduction to our teachers. We're 75% uh, full year up front. There's one missing, but uh, I'll leave it over to Kay at this point to tell you a little bit about the school. Some of you know about it. Uh, you've been around long enough to know about it. Others of you, it may be new to you, and uh, we're extending a renewed uh, gesture or hand of friendship and partnership towards the school from, from our congregation. And so we've invited Kay to come and share with you a little bit about the school and, of course, uh, to introduce the teachers to us. Okay, over to you. Well, good morning. As the pastor said, I'm the uh, principal at the school at the moment. I've had an association with the school for a number of years now, 13 years, when I enrolled, enrolled my own children there. And so I've had many hats on over those 13 years. I've been a parent, I've been a board member and a teacher, and now I'm the principal. Um, I have here on my right Lee and Lorelei. Lorelei, you know, as the person in your community, um, and she is in the junior room teaching the children from new entrants to at currently at year five. And Lee is working with her, so they job share in that junior room. I am in the senior room with uh, Margaret Chapman, who wasn't able to make it today. And I do two and a half days in there teaching and two and a half days working as a principal, though my job as principal is continual. Um, and I present, I've got a PowerPoint that I put together yesterday. 
very quickly, and it's years since I've put a PowerPoint together. I instruct children too, but I haven't actually done it myself for a while, so um, this was my quick rendition. So the slides are our children in different poses, and I've also used the message, our vision, and our vision is the Adventist vision for all our schools, which is growth. So I'll just use that acronym to introduce our school and some of what we do. Right, so these are our children. We are committed to Adventist education. And it's all about growth. And growth is the acronym that we have for our vision. We're just developing a new garden area at the moment. So growth, the acronym, is godliness, rich relationships, ownership of mastery, wisdom and decisions, transformational learning, and harvest focus. Our job is to open windows to God's presence. This is our godliness, the G of our growth. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Rich relationships. <coughs> the future of those we cherish will be a reflection of what we model today. So as staff, we are encouraging and nurturing and challenging our children within the areas of all of our vision. Ownership of mastery, encouraging our children to own their learning and set their goals. No life ever grows great until it is focused, dedicated, and disciplined. So encouraging always the children to show wisdom in the decisions they make. I have discovered I always have choices, and sometimes it's only a choice of attitude. Few things will capture our hearts, but these are the things worth pursuing. And our harvest focus. So as gardeners, we have so we sow the seeds and we also have a harvest focus in mind always. That's our vision. So that our children will grow to be the best they can be for this world and for the next. Success, the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So that's your local school, our wonderful school. So thank you for inviting me and our staff and um, for this chance to worship with you. Thank you. And before you sit down again, I'm going to ask Gary to help us with just handing over a small token of our appreciation to each of the students, uh, <laughs> each of the teachers, uh, for what they are doing with our learners, with our students there at the school. Um, what's the enrolment at present? At present we've got 30. 30. That's in the school, not a class. <laughs> and. Uh, We'd like to encourage you, if you live in the town area and you know friends uh, that are looking for a good place to send their children for a quality Christian education, uh, the Whangarei Adventist School is the place for them to send them. So we want to encourage you to share that with your friends if you happen to have children and you're close enough by to make it worthwhile for you to send them to the school. We'd like to encourage you to do that as well. And um, so at this point, Gary, if you will give to our teachers, to Kay as our headmaster, to Laura Lee and to Lee, 
a little token of our appreciation. It's, uh, it seemed appropriate that there being uh, educators themselves, that we give them a book. You know, just made sense. And we've chosen a very specific book, one which uh, I'm sure some of you will have read yourselves in the congregation. And that book is the book written by Ellen White entitled Education. It is a book which shares the vision of the Adventist Church's education model, our goals and our objectives. And uh, if you haven't, you may have already read it. But if you haven't, it's a powerful, powerful book. It really is a powerful book. And uh, for those of you who are in the congregation and you have young children, it's a good read for you as parents as well because it will help you make intelligent decisions in regard to your children's education and uh, the priorities that we should ascribe to that. So may God bless you in the work that you're doing there. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, we trust that the words in that book will be a blessing to you as well. Thank you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace this morning. Thank you for the work that our educators put in to develop the characters and the minds and the physical bodies of our, of our, of our children in the community and our children in the church. We thank you for the dedication of teachers, Lord. And we know that at times this job ranks up there with the toughest in the world dealing with young minds, seeking to influence and to change and to bless and to direct heavenward. We pray, Lord, that you will bless our teachers in our school, that you'll bless our enrollment, and that you'll give us a spirit of wisdom and a love for Jesus above all else. And now, Lord, as we turn and focus our attention for a moment on your word, again, will you guide us, will you direct us, and will you bless us? For we pray this in Jesus' name. I've entitled the message for this morning, True Education, the Restoration of the Image of God in Humanity. And to get us started, I want to share with you a little bit of what God's ideal is, and we'll be going to the very first book in Genesis, where it all began, the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 26 to 27, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. A profound passage, I have referenced it many times in past messages and sermons in this congregation. It's one of those passages which I keep coming back to. You know, if we are to understand in the role of education what the ultimate goal is, what we should be seeking to attain through the education of our young people, then we need to understand two things. We need to understand God's ideal, what his plan is, what his vision is. And we need to understand the nature of mankind particularly as we experience it in practical, everyday life. In other words, you need to know where you are, what your nature is, and you need to be able to compare that with God's ideal, with God's plan, with God's big picture. And to give you an idea of the big picture, I read to you from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. It's describing God's vision behind the creation of man. And it says here, Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Obviously, what stands out there is the author seems to keep bringing us back. He repeats it numerous times in the image of God. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
Let us make man in our image. We were designed, God's master plan, his intention, his vision, was that we would reflect who he was. We would be a mirror of his own character and of his own being. That when he created mankind, his intention was not just to have, as I've said before, a petting zoo, some planet where he and the angels could wander through a pretty garden and play with pretty animals. But his intention behind creating was a race of beings that could enter into his mind, could understand his heart, could connect to him. And to, in order for that to happen, they had to, of course, be in his image. They had to resemble him. We had to somehow be able to reflect him. Otherwise, it would be impossible for a deep and meaningful connection. So God invents this vision of mankind created in his image, a race of beings with whom he could share himself and who in like manner could reciprocate and share themselves with him, who could understand his thoughts, could sympathize with his heart, could enter into his feelings, could grasp his vision, could choose like he chooses, freedom of choice. A race of beings to be noble in stature, in mind, in intellect, in heart, to be upright, to be as true to principle as the kneel is to the pole, to be looking upward and moving onward. That was God's ideal. That was his invention. That was why he created humanity. That's God's master plan. It goes on to say that after he created them, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That is, we were to share this idea of procreation. He as the great creator lends to us the gift of creation. Amazing to think of. A gift which he hadn't even shared with the angels, by the way, if we are to understand what Jesus had said about the angels to the scribes and to the Sadducees and to the Pharisees in the New Testament, that they neither marry nor are given in marriage, etc., etc. But humanity was different. We would share in his ability to create. We were in his image. We would have dominion like he has dominion. We would have uh, ownership like he has ownership. We would manage and be in charge of and have responsibility like he did. Because everything in this planet, in this sphere of existence, was committed into the care of the beings that were raised or, or, or created in the image of God. They would have dominion. They would care for. They would be responsible for. They would procreate. They would have the ability to bring forth a life out of love between one another, just as God creates out of the love. For the Bible tells us in the New Testament, God is love. And love begets life. He says, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. So right there, as they come forth from the Creator's hand, God even has a health message for them. Can we put it like that? He a, even has a health message. He says, I have, as the Creator, designed you in a certain way to operate on certain fuels. And he outlines what that plan is for them. They were to share his intellect, to share his heart, to share his vision, to share his responsibilities, to share his ability to care, to share his ability to bring forth life. They were to care for their own beings and their own bodies. An ideal picture, isn't it? An ideal picture. Speaking of this ideal, we read in the book Education, page 15, where Ellen White writes and says, It was God's purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image. This image we've been speaking about, the image of God. That in other words, what happened there in the Garden of Eden was not the end of the journey. Adam and Eve were not to be static human beings. God had built into them potential. And where they were starting was just the beginning of their potential. They were to learn. They were to grow. They were to increase. They were to reflect the image of God more fully day by day, all the way through eternity. If I'm to understand that statement correctly, I almost think God may have even shared with us, to a greater or lesser degree, he may have even shared with us the idea of infinity. That human beings could grow and grow and grow some more. And just when you think you've reached your full potential, you could still grow some more. 
And that was in a perfect world without sin. It wasn't because we have fallen that we now must learn and we now must grow. It was God's intention from the very beginning that you and I would grow beyond measure. Continually through the ceaseless ages of eternity. To reflect more fully the glory of the Creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. And yet today where we find ourselves, despite this great and glorious picture that's painted for us in Scripture and through the inspired councils, despite that, we find ourselves not living out God's ideal, but we find ourselves in the midst and the results of our own human failings. We read about the story, of course, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, just two chapters after this great ideal painted for humanity's beginnings and God's intentions for us. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, you know the story, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And that day, that day God's plans... God's plans for his children were smashed, destroyed. Now that may be something some of you sitting here can relate to. Maybe you've raised children and you've dreamed with your partner. You've dreamed with your spouse about where this child is going to go when they get older. You see the dawning of intelligence in their eyes. You understand the potential. You see the spirit. The flicker of spiritual love for God growing in them. You see the intelligence beginning to dawn. the, The first words, the first steps, the first run, the first questions, the endless, uh, never ending um, chain of why questions, and you realize the potential that this child has. You send them off to school. And they further their education and they begin to grow and they come home and they tell you stuff which you think a five-year-old shouldn't even know. This is amazing. This is awesome. You get excited. But then they hit that turbulent phase in life. That phase where they begin to question their identity and they begin to wonder about who they are and how they fit in with the world around them. And they begin to push the boundaries and question and things start to go wrong. All of a sudden, they know more than you. And I always say I always knew the most when I was about 16. At 16, I had acquired all knowledge and I knew everything. Now that I'm 32, twice that age, I've revised that position somewhat. And it seems like the older you get, the more complex the questions of life become in some ways. And you realize you don't have all the answers. And you as a parent have watched your child grow like this. And you've had these great aspirations. Maybe they are going to be that neurosurgeon that changes the world. Maybe they're going to be that inventor like Thomas Edison. Or maybe maybe they're going to be that, that someone special that revolutionizes the way we live. That does something positive for humanity. Or even if that wasn't your great dream for them. Just that they would grow up to know and to love the Lord. And your dreams are shattered then you know what it was like for God in that day when Adam and Eve chose to eat of that fruit and he knew what he had created them to become. You know, you as a parent, you and I do not even understand the full potential of our children. The vision that you and I have for our children is but a very, 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 very dim glimmer of what God knows they can become. And it destroys us or comes close to it when our dreams for our children are destroyed. When we see them making all those foolish decisions and we, and we just think, what is going to come of this? Can you begin to imagine the God who designed us, who made us, who did not underestimate our potential, but knew the full potential that humanity was endowed with? Could you imagine what it would have been like for the heart of God that day? When the one tree in that entire garden of luxury, that garden of opulence, that garden of pristine beauty, the best the creator could offer, the most wonderful home he could imagine in his own mind, a creation that he stood back and said, it is very good. 
having given his children every advantage possible to them. And they do the only thing, the only thing that can bring disfavor upon themselves. Can you even begin to imagine the pain, the hurt, the disappointed, and perhaps even the shattered dreams of the Heavenly Father? As parents, maybe we can begin to imagine. Contrast God's idea with this statement also in the book Education, page 15, where it says, Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. His spiritual vision was dimmed. And he had become subject to death. Can you see the contrast between the two pictures? God's ideal... And humanity's nature, warped, defective, fallen, no longer what God had created it to be, its potential marred, that image of God almost wiped out. And I think that 6,000 years down from that garden home, 6,000 years from that moment in time where Adam and Eve set this human race on this journey that you and I are pilgrims in ourselves, at 6,000 years down the line, I want to say to you that perhaps this side of the picture almost seems to be stronger than ever. All you have to do is watch the news, right? Read the, read the newspapers or just look at what goes on in your own community. In the neighbor's house next door, or wait a second, maybe we don't even have to look that far. Maybe all we have to do is look in the mirror. Maybe all we have to do is look at our own thoughts, the affections of our own heart, the way we treat our loved ones. Maybe all we have to do is stand at the foot of a cross and compare our love and devotion for God to what we see displayed of his love and devotion on the cross for us. And this statement is proved true beyond measure. Our physical form has deteriorated. We're midgets. You know, in the world today, we have this idea that previous generations were worse off and that we are better off. You know, it fits in with the whole evolutionary paradigm that we're going from, you know, single-celled to complex creatures by chance and natural selection. And that whole false idea of origins gives rise to this idea that we today are the ones that are at the pinnacle of human experience. But if we're to understand the testimony of Scripture correctly, friends, you and I are the dregs of humanity. You and I are as far away from the Garden of Eden as possible. That even after Adam and Eve had fallen, and that statement is true of them, 6,000 years down the line, you and I are even further from the ideal than they were. Physically, mentally, spiritually, on every level. But the good news is there's hope. You see, you've got to understand that the extent to which you've fallen before you can understand the love for God revealed in the plan of salvation. That though this is us, that though we shattered his dreams and broke his heart, that having the heart of a parent, he refused to let his child go. He refused to just accept that we were going to walk away into oblivion, never to be seen again. And that parent's heart inside of God, that fatherly compassion, resulted in him coming himself. Jesus, the one that Colossians 2 verse 9 says that in him all the fullness of the deity dwelt in bodily form. That taking on humanity, he comes, God himself, in human flesh. Why? To become this. He takes on our fallen humanity, our weakened physical nature, our degeneracy. He comes and he suffers in our place, he takes our penalty. And he walks into oblivion on our behalf so that we can walk out of oblivion and into the kingdom of God. That's the plan of salvation. That's the father's heart yearning for his children that they spend eternity with him. And that is the goal 
of education. All true education is to direct the mind and the heart, to rediscover the potential, God's ideal. And yes, it will only be capped and crowned once he comes on the clouds of heaven. When, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, from verse 50 and onwards, where it describes that day when the Lord shall come. And it says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. And the dead will be raised incorruptible. For this mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Raised back to the potential of Adam and Eve. Changed in the twinkling of an eye. If you and I are that generation alive when Jesus comes. Yes, that is the graduation, if you like. That is the graduation ceremony where you finally get your degree. But the work begins today, friends. This process of education. And when we're talking about education, yes, of course, in the context of today's service, we are talking about our schools and our classrooms and our teachers and those little people in our lives. But here's what you need to understand about the kingdom of God's education system. It does not end when you finish seventh form. It does not end at the end of university. It is a lifetime of education. And your mentor, your tutor, is none other than God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit. To think that he is our trainer, our mentor, that you and I, just like the disciples, walked with Jesus for three and a half years, talked with Jesus for three and a half years, were modeled ministry, were modeled salvation, were modeled the vision of God for humanity for three and a half years, that you and I have the privilege throughout our lives, if we choose to accept it, to be enrolled without questions asked, without conditions, enrolled into the university of the kingdom of heaven, and we sit directly under the personal tutelage of the Holy Spirit himself. He gives us the angels to help us along our way. He brings us into the fellowship of a church family that we may journey together and learn together. He gives us the textbook, which is the scriptures. He's even seen fit to inspire prophetic writings for an end time generation. He leads us through life and he teaches us and guides us. And what is the goal? The goal is that though we have fallen, Though his dreams were shattered through the cross and what he has accomplished for us and the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the angels, the fellowship of Christian believers and this thing we call the church, through all these benefits he's given us, that his ideals, his plans, his dreams, his vision for us will again be fulfilled. You and I can begin to reach our God-given potential even down here. As we have under prophetic inspiration, the statement that I quoted to the children earlier on, that nothing is so calculated to strengthen the mind and to broaden the intellect than is the study of the word of God. Chief of textbooks, let it be second to none. It is healing to the mind and to the body. And I can testify to that because you know my story of how I came out of the world of drug addiction. You know how it wrecked my life. And how it ruined my mind. And people say, Adrian, how did, you, how did you find any sort of semblance of healing from that? And the only thing I can credit it with is the miracle working of power through the, of God through the study of the scriptures. That as I studied this book, wrestled with its concepts, you know, the mind, the mind is designed in such a way by God that it will adapt itself to the subjects on which it dwells. So if the only thing that your mind is going to be allowed to dwell on is SpongeBob SquarePants, then don't be surprised if you start to act like a cartoon character. If you fail to grasp the real issues in life. And if you just don't really develop all that well. But when you allow the mind to dwell on the eternal things of God, when you wrestle with the concepts of salvation, when you deal with the, with the philosophies of life that the scriptures contain, that mind which has been dwarfed by a lifetime of worldliness, wrong kinds of music, wrong kinds of movies, wrong kinds of entertainment, wrong kinds of whatever it is, and by wrong kinds I mean the kinds that are going to dwarf the potential of God for your life. I'll let you decide which those are. 
But when you turn to the Word of God and surrender your life to Him, He has the ability to take that dwarfed mind and begin to expand it again. So what is the ultimate goal of true education? Perhaps it's best summarized in the words found in the book Education Again, where it says, Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, that is to say, God-likeness, that is that we resemble God, is the goal to be reached. What is the highest aspiration you have ever had for your child? What is the highest aspiration you've ever had for yourself? I want you to, to stretch your mind and push the limits. Imagine as far as you can go, what would be the place where you wish you could be? If you could live your life over again with the knowledge you have now and building on that, what would you choose differently? What would be your highest aspiration? What would it, if you got to a certain place, you would say, that's it, I've attained to it. Where is that place in your mind? Where is that place in your mind for your child? When you reach that place in your imagination, what you need to understand is that God's vision, according to that statement, goes even way beyond that ability of you to comprehend. So stretch it some more and push it a little bit further than, than what you thought you were able to go in your imagination and in your thoughts. And then when you get to that place, know that God's highest thoughts are still way beyond that place. The highest place you can imagine for yourself for your child, and God's imagination goes beyond that. So maybe we need to pray a little differently. Maybe we need to ask God to start giving us His vision for our lives, His vision for our homes, His vision for our church, and His vision for our young people. Maybe we need to ask God to, 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 to enable us to go beyond what we're capable of imagining and to begin to see through His eyes. And then maybe we need to also ask God that he would fulfill that for our homes and for our children, for ourselves, for our church family, for our schools. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness or God-likeness is the goal to be reached. If our educational institutions, if our church if our homes and our families are just about teaching letters and numbers, the ABCs, if it's just about preparing our children for university, if all it is is about ensuring that we decrease unemployment in our country, if all it is is, 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 is about increasing opulence and wealth, then we have failed as a people of God. We have failed as teachers, we have failed as schools, and we have failed as a church. God's highest ideal is godliness or God-likeness. That all true education revolves about restoring in man this fallen image of God. Restoring it to what it once was. As it says again in pages 15 and 16 of the book Education, to restore in man or in humanity the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption, and this is the object of education, the great object of life. Parents, I want to ask you, how do you choose educational institutions for your children? What's your criteria? Children, young people, I want to ask you, those of you that are high school, where are you going in your life? I want to ask you, on what basis will you choose a career? I want to ask you, on what basis will you choose your institution of higher learning? I want to ask you, why would you go to the school you go to? I want to challenge you. Young people and parents, our educators who are with us today, I want to challenge you that the highest objective of education is to restore in humanity the character of God. Again, if all we're aiming for is the highest pass rate in our town, we are failing. If all we're aiming for is big numbers of enrollment, we are failing. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with those other objectives. <laughs> but listen carefully. 
the highest objective of education is your connection with God. Your reflection of the beauty of His character, the reproduction of His mind in you, the infilling of you with His vision and with His power to accomplish that vision. It is for this reason that this church was raised up, for this reason that this church and its educational institutions were raised up. Everything in this church around the worldwide church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, is geared and intended in the ideal to accomplish this great objective. Where are you in your experience? Where are you in your walk with God? Do you have his vision, his goals? Do you share his passion? And above all else, is it your intention and your choice to have his character reproduced in you? Because if, like God, that is your highest objective for your life, that will be the single guiding principle in all your decision-making situations. Choosing educational institutions, Choosing what to allow into the home by way of influences. What is life about for you? Is the question I leave you to think about. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that in a little while we are indeed going home. And it is our prayer this morning that you would help us every day of our lives in regard to our own characters, in regard to those of our children, to make the choices that would be best for them, best for the development of this character in a way that it comes to reflect the beauty and the symmetry and the completeness of that of your own, that we would come to reflect you, Lord, and that as we reflect you, this world will be lightened with a testimony of who you are, that many others will join the ranks of those who intend to make it through to your kingdom for eternity. Lord, make our lives a thing of beauty and forgive us where we have failed to do our part. Will you bless our school here in this little town? And again, I ask that you will bless our teachers in a special way that you would fill them with your vision, of your spiritual vision, for each of the children that attend that school. May the children receive of that spirit, which will mean salvation for their souls, and a character that reflects the beauty of Jesus. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.